So it's for me to introduce Dr. Michael Glynn, um, who's here. I, Dr. Glynn is a consultant gastroenterologist with an interest in nutrition here at Barts in London. And uh, I'm sure quite a few of you know him um, already. He's got vast experience in managing nutrition and uh, super obstruction. So Thank you very much, Kasim, for asking me to contribute, and thank you all for, for coming and listening attentively. So I'm a trained, as, as you were, just like Kasim, as a gastroenterologist. Um, I've done quite a lot of things over my time. I actually do some liver disease as well, so I have a hepatologist attached by name. But certainly for the last eight or ten years, I've, my main contribution to the service has been in nutrition. Now, nutrition is a very wide-ranging name and subject. What I and my team actually do is try to make sure that patients who are ill for other reasons are correctly nourished. So I don't get involved with patients who are overweight, which is another area of nutrition. Um, I get involved with patients who are either underweight or have a potential to be underweight and who have, have uh, clinical effects uh, because of that. So in relation to pseudo-obstruction and GI motility disorders, there are essentially two, two ways that nutrition are a problem. There are nutritional issues. There are difficulties with eating, becoming undernourished in some way. It's actually quite difficult to define undernourishment. Is it to do with weight? Is it to do with specific measurement? People have tried to devise measurements and scores, blood measurements, functional measurements, muscle strength, all sorts of things. And we use some of those some of the time. But actually, weight is pretty good. We know what people wear. It's incredibly simple and a measurement that doesn't cost anything. And we know what people ought to weigh based on their height. And largely, we go on weight in spite of having a lot of other techniques available. There is a whole area of using nutrition as treatment, special diets and so forth. I'm actually, given the restricted time, I'm actually not going to talk about that, and I'm going to talk about nourishing people who, have, who are or have the potential to be undernourished. Why does it matter if we have a, you know, you should have a body mass index, a calculation of weight and height of over 20 or perhaps over 18, why does it matter if your body mass index is only 40? And the answer is there are a whole lot of general effects. So you lose weight, well that might be, some patients actually want, some people actually want to do that. But uh, or undoubtedly you have, as your weight begins to decline, you have reduced energy and stamina. There was a rather extraordinary experiment done in the 1940s uh, by some Americans who were trying to prepare for the aftermath of war with lots of people who were undernourished. They decided to take a whole lot of of inverted commas volunteers who were actually conscientious objectors and put them in a camp and starve them deliberately for three months and see what would happen. It's a fantastic experiment. It's completely unethical nowadays, but there is a lot of data in there and it shows all sorts of things happen, that you do get reduced energy and stamina. Your heart function, if you lose 20%, 20 or 30% of your body weight, your heart function might reduce by 30%. So it's not surprising you feel pretty awful and can't do anything. And then there's a sort of vicious circle. The more weight you lose, you get things like altered taste. You also get depressed. And what happens when you have altered taste and depressed? Well, you don't eat anything. And so you lose more weight. So there's a considerable vicious circle in there. There are specific effects, obviously. You may get deficient in the things we can measure. So a range of vitamins, vitamin D, folic acid, B12, B1, which is difficult to measure, but is an important, can have important clinical effects, and also vitamin C. You can come deficient in specific minerals, iron, calcium, magnesium, zinc, and, in, and some small print minerals, which, which can occasionally be important in patients who are on exclusive intravenous feeding. So we have a patient who is underweight or at risk of becoming underweight. They're feeling the clinical effects. They don't have much stamina. And when you get down to BMIs towards 14, you really are quite debilitated. I have a vividly in mind one patient who came to us as a late teenager um, who was sort of sitting in a, ch in a wheelchair, almost mute. And that actually, as it turned out, when she was properly nourished, was entirely due to malnutrition. It wasn't due to her illness. 
So we have a patient with that extreme or in the middle somewhere, and we have to support the nutrition somehow. And in fact, there's a vast range of support from the very simple to the very complex. The very simple is, is supplemental. A dietitian who is a graduate practitioner who is specializes in, understands nutrition and specializes in, in providing nutrition support in all sorts of areas, uh, is a very helpful person. Now, there aren't enough dietitians around, there aren't enough being paid for in the community or in hospitals, but if you can get access to one, they're often excellent people. And what they can do is just, is they can educate you, they can uh, advise you how to fortify the food you can eat so you're getting the maximum nutritional value. Some people are still eating, when, they sh when they're losing weight, a very healthy diet. Well, if, uh, perhaps that's laudable, but actually what they want to do is eat a non-healthy diet and pile in the calories in whatever way they can, and that can make a certain amount of difference. There may be specific vitamin deficiencies that are needed. We can go on to enteral feeding, which is a tube feeding of different kinds, and then at the, the small print, the, and the few, luckily, uh, will need to go on to intravenous feeding. So let's just consider a few of these areas. When is it needed? In general, if, if weight loss is more than 10% from some sort of baseline. Now, in a very long chronic disease, or in some patients a lifelong disease, how do we know where the weight loss comes in? It's really perhaps more about low weight below the range of body mass index or below 10% of the range, we certainly should be worried. And certainly specific deficiencies which can be mainly addressed by simple supplementation. So there is a wide range of nutritional supplements in addition to just arranging your diet. So on the bottom right we have packeted nutritional supplements. There, there are other brands that are available as they say on the BBC. Um, and essentially they are just whole food packaged in a, in, in a, in a concentrated way and sometimes one advises patients to think of them more like a medicine than a food, and perhaps that makes them more tolerable. Although as somebody who had, uh, whose general practitioner was only a, uh, absolutely insisted on uh, providing only one brand, because that was the brand that the CCG would pay for, uh, the patient said, how would you like to live on mashed potato every day of your life? Mm. So variety is important. There is so much more about eating than just getting in the food, the food value. And that's a very real issue that one has to try and work around. On the top left, we have some vitamin supplements. There's a vast range in the, in, in the health food shops or in the chemist. There isn't a huge amount to choose. And to some extent, one, one multivitamin is, is, is like another. On the bottom left, we have an unhealthy meal. And that may be quite good for some people. Indeed, some people think that the malnutrition in hospital, as which we see a lot of, most patients in hospital going out weighing less than they came in, non-intentionally, is largely due to the failure of hospitals to provide a cooked breakfast. <laughs> and one of the simplest in nutritional interventions in hospital could be a cooked breakfast. <laughs> we get very exercised about vitamin D. We sometimes think that everybody is vitamin D deficient, although the scientists among us well, can't understand how, if biological values are derived statistically, how can everybody be deficient? That seems a bit of a conundrum that I haven't got my head around yet. But a lot of patients are vitamin D deficient. Some of it's nutritional, some of it's lack of sunlight because vitamin D is made in your skin as a response to sunlight. We have a lot of patients with darker skin who cover up and they don't make much vitamin D. And you have less vitamin D in the winter. Again, there's a big range of supplements. But if you can't swallow the supplements or you have a problem with pseudo obstruction, there may be a big problem of absorption. And this seems, vitamin D seems to be an area and we quite like the bottom right, which is a mouth spray of vitamin D. It's actually classed as a food supplement, so it's not prescribable, bizarrely, so you have to buy it. Um, and it's just like a little breath freshener. There's not a lot of data around whether it really works, but my impression is that it does, and it's certainly very simple. So if we move on, if we've got a patient, a person who we've had all the dietetic input, the symptoms are bad, they're not able to eat consistently, they've tried a range of nutritional supplements, they're on the right vitamins, but they're still losing weight and they're getting effects, clinical effects of malnutrition, then we may need to think about tube feeding. Now, in a way, you might say, well, why is tube feeding going to work? It's only going to put liquidized feed, usually, where it will go in the same as if you drink it. And there's a lot of things to do with nutrition, there's a lot of trial and error. And there are certainly people, for instance, who have a, a tube into their stomach, 
who can infuse liquid food through the tube in some sort of schedule, and if they tr which works to some extent, and if they drink it, it doesn't work. Now, there's various reasons why that might be. It might just be about quantity. It might be about time of day. Uh, but, uh, but it, there are a range of things as to why that might happen. But certainly, tube feeding in patients who are not maintaining their weight needs to be thought about quite closely. There are a range of tubes that you can put down through the nose, and the, paper, the tube on the right is a fairly standard nasogastric tube, um, tube on the, uh, which ends up in the stomach. The tube on the left is a longer tube, which can be passed through the pylorus and into the jejunum. So for patients who have a motility disorder which predominantly affects the stomach, feeding directly into the bowel below the stomach may be helpful. And on our trial and error basis, we may get, we often have to do this in hospital, it's difficult to do the initial feeding out of hospital. We may trial nasogastric feeding and we may trial nasogeginal feeding to see wh which works. What will the patient tolerate? Does an increased rate of feeding produce pain? Does it produce bloating? There's often a very critical value. Patients may find that if you put feed in at 20 mils an hour, they'll cope with it. If you put it in at 40 mils an hour, they won't. And they may, uh, you can get down to very, very closely defined values. If those tubes will work, then we can go over to some sort of through the skin access, because most people do not want to walk around with a tube coming out of their nose. Now, there are people who do. And of course, I'm only talking about adults, it's rather different in children. And we have a few patients who absolutely don't want uh, any sort of tube through the skin. And the hypermobility patients sometimes don't tolerate the tubes through the skin very well. And I, I, I've certainly got two or three patients who pass a nasogastric tube at night themselves, give themselves an overnight feed, take the tube out in the morning and go to work. And they do that every night. So one can be quite creative. <laughs> But for a lot of people who need tube feeding, the through the skin approach is, is, is the way to go. This is a fairly standard PEG tube. PEG stands for percutaneous through the skin. Endoscopic means we place it with an endoscope in the stomach. And gastrostomy mean, means into the stomach. The top left is the tube on the outside. The bottom left is the tube on the inside. And the, bottom, and the right hand one is a different device, which is a button. It doesn't have an external tube. It's relatively low profile, perhaps better for younger patients who, who um, or any patient who doesn't, who just finds the, the large external tube troublesome. A PEG J is a, is a tube which has the PEG, but there's another tube that internally goes through from, from the stomach to the bowel and allows for bowel, for feeding directly into the bowel, and then occasionally we put tubes directly through the skin into the bowel, which is a small surgical procedure. So this is quite good for patients who, well, then this can be very, very good for patients who don't, can't manage with all ordinary eating or drinking liquid supplements, who clearly do well with tube feeding, and over time, uh, that these can and, and these can last for ages. The manufacturers put a life of, say, please change them at a year, but we ignore that, and we've certainly had the same tube in for five years. For a very small cohort, and there's a few in the room I can see, um, we have to give up the gut altogether. For whatever reason, you've heard before why that might be, you've heard about the research trying to work out why it happens and how to treat it. But the gut will no longer take enough food by whatever method you put it in to provide nourishment. And then we resort to intravenous feeding. Intravenous feeding, well it was very, the first experiment was done by Sir Christopher Wren in the, in the 17th century when he infused milk into an animal in the vein to see what would happen. So there's nothing new under the sun. The, what we now recognize as intravenous feeding was developed in the 50s and 60s in the States. It got a bad name because a lot of patients got infections through the catheters. And then in the late 70s, we began to understand what, how to prevent that. And, there, and so there are, there, it is now a standard treatment, either short term in hospital, after you've had some sort of surgical procedure, or for a small group of patients, say about 2,000 in the UK as we speak, that's not very many, um, a, a more permanent process when the gut has, has failed altogether on, on essentially a permanent basis. Pseudo obstruction and motility disorders is not the only reason, so for our 55 patients that we're supervising on long-term uh, home parental nutrition, 18 of them have pseudo obstruction motility disorders, so it's about a third. Now because 
we, we are a centre for that. Uh, that's perhaps overrepresented. Countrywide, it's probably about 10 or 15 percent only. The other patients having Crohn's disease and having some sort of injury to their bowel, usually. The process is to have a long-term intravenous catheter, usually a Hickman catheter, seen on the left. Occasionally, we have other catheters. The patient on the right has a has a catheter from the arm, a pick line, and a few patients will have totally indwelling uh, systems called porter caths. Um, and they can last a long time, provided they, they're kept sterile. Uh, you can, um, I think the longest we've got is a patient who's had the same Hickman line for 11 years. So it is possible, essentially, to live with a catheter permanently. Um, and our longest survivor on home PN, not a pseudo-obstruction patient, is 29 years. Um, so it, this is a, a proven long-term treatment. And, um, oh, how do I go back? Oh, sorry about this. And let's just go back to that one. Uh, where are we? Sorry, share on the current slide. There we go. Um, this doesn't project very well, but this patient has a has the intravenous feeding bag there, which is a large um, a large intravenous bag, spe usually specially made for the patient, and it contains well actually up to four liters of fluid. Some people, perhaps who have stomas, need extra fluid because they're losing fluid, and they may need to infuse uh, above average volumes. That will be quite a lot more than than than, than but would normally be drunk in the day. Most people infuse overnight, uh, but some people infuse during the day. Some people have back packs with, with, uh, with uh, feed uh, pumping more continuously for various reasons. So there's quite a big variety of what can be done. Um, but it is a very good treatment. And the patient who arrived in my clinic with a body mass index of 14 in a wheelchair completely mute is now up and about and, and a lively late teenager and going to college and has a partner. And I'm sure that's entirely nutritional because nothing else has changed. So it can, it can be dramatically successful um, uh, home intravenous feeding, but it is very much about selecting the right patient who really needs it, because it's a really difficult treatment and has some risk. It's also very expensive, but that's the NHS's problem, not your problem. Um, how, is, how does all this work? Well, the answer is that most hospitals now, and certainly big hospitals doing lots of work in this area, will have a, a nutrition support team, and there usually be one for adults and one for children. And broadly, there are four key people. You need a doctor of some kind. It doesn't have to be a gastroenterologist, actually. It just has to be somebody with an interest in nutrition and who knows what they're doing. We need a dietitian. They're absolutely key for everything to do with the entral. Uh, we need a nurse specialist because they're very good at the tubes and understanding the, or, or, a lot of the technical stuff. And on the intravenous side, we need a pharmacist because the pre preparation of the intravenous feeding is a pharmaceutical process. And it's a very, um, you probably heard a lot about multidisciplinary team working in hospitals, in all sorts of areas. The first nutrition team in the UK was at St. Mark's Hospital in 1978, uh, which was set up by uh, my predecessor, Professor Paul Tuck, who some of you may have met. Um, and I think actually that was almost the first example of a truly multidisciplinary uh, team. And we work very well together. We're very non-hierarchical. That's absolutely key. So we can all do a bit of everything and we don't really have a leader. We're quite happy for anybody to lead at any time. And that's absolutely key to success of this sort of team. So the conclusion is that attention nutrition is very important for some patients, although actually it's less needed for others. And I think that's important to get the balance. It isn't always a critical issue. There's a wide range of attention to nutrition in, in patients with pseudo obstruction or any GI disease. And the simple stuff, you often find the simple stuff hasn't been done properly. And you're being asked to go on to the more complex when actually what you need to do is get back to the simple. But there are complex interventions. And intravenous feeding is a, is a complex intervention, there's no question. Although it can be brilliant for some people. And, it can, and the right attention to nutrition certainly makes a big, uh, a big difference to quality of life. Thank you very much.